if anybody, if you could push in the answer. So some people have, yeah, people have soft ones. We're on. Well, welcome to the first of two uh, adult education classes on a time for wisdom. Boy, if this isn't timely in our day. Mm, do we need wisdom? I need wisdom. Um, we are so delighted to have Mark McMinn, who is one of my former colleagues at George Fox University. He got his uh, a bachelor's at Lewis and Clark, did his PhD at Vanderbilt, taught at Wheaton for, what'd you say, how many years? 13 years, and then also taught at George Fox for how many? 23, a lot. So, and what I know him best for is, um, shortly after I came, we, we did a um, integration class for the PsyD students, the ther budding therapist to be, graduate level, and uh, it was an integration of theology and psychology, and, I did the theology part, and Mark was so good because he's so integratively thinking. He thinks integratively, and he would say things like, well, we've heard about the Doctrine of Atonement. What are the implications for how we do uh, therapy in light of the Doctrine of Atonement? And, and you just were natural at making those bridges, and um, so it was just fun for me. And you're in for a treat. Um, Mark has so much to share, and I will not take up any more time. Mark McMinn. Thanks, thank you. I think, oh. I think I'm on here, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. Uh, as some of you know, th this actually, the topic, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the story in a bit, but the topic comes out of a conversation with a former student that ended up in a book that came out in the middle of COVID, or, or near the tail end of COVID, it came out in 2022, and we called it A Time for Wisdom. And some of you have written, and you know that there are certain scary things about writing a book. And so let me mention a couple of them. One is the ink is permanent. You can't go change your mind later after things come out. And it turns out that I'm one who changes my mind a lot. So that often <laughs> causes some regret. I'm going to say some more about that in just a minute. The second is the title, because the publisher has something to do with the title, will probably be self-aggrandizing, and uh, or at least be viewed as self-aggrandizing. So I want to start with that as a sort of disclaimer, um, because uh, I'll, I'll mention a, a, a previous book. In 2017, I wrote a book called The Science of Virtue, and I had a colleague at the time, the day it came out, who looked at me and said, Mark, how does it feel to know that you literally wrote the book on virtue? And it just terrified me to think about that because uh, anyone who knows me you know, real well would know, no, I'm not that guy. I'm not like an exemplar of, of, of virtue. Uh, and so it, I said, no, 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 this is a book about the science of virtue. I'm a social scientist. This is about science. Um, and so now, here's this book, A Time for Wisdom, and of course, the natural thing is to think, oh, I must know a lot about wisdom, but again, as I look at my life, and if people who know me well would sort of say, what are you doing writing about wisdom? Right around the time this book came out, um, my wife had a problem with her iPhone, the battery wasn't working, and I thought, well, I'm pretty good with technology, um, I can fix that. So, oh, let's see, so that's her phone, uh, torn apart. I was gonna, I, I, I found a YouTube video, I had all the tools, I ordered the tools, I ordered a new battery, I figured out how to change the battery, and then I tore a cable that couldn't be repaired and I had to buy her a new iPhone. Right around the same time that this book, A Time for Wisdom, comes out. So, um, so there you have it. And of course, that's the safe example. I'm giving you the safe example, I could give you a lot more that would make me look even more foolish. Back to the first point, uh, the ink is permanent. So let me tell you a little bit about how this book came about. Um, this is Paul McLaughlin. He's the co-author of, of the book, A Time for Wisdom. And Paul was a doctoral student of mine, and he came into my office. He, he had just finished a master's degree in theology, and he came into my office, uh, his first year of study, and he said, Mark, I think I know what I want to do my dissertation on. I want to do it on wisdom. And I looked at Paul, I tried to be as kind as I could in saying this, I looked at Paul and I said, you know, it's a great topic, Paul, but psychologists, we just don't study wisdom. It's really not something we study. And so Paul goes to the library and proves me wrong. 
it turns out that there is a long tradition, I just didn't know, but there's a long tradition, especially in Europe, of, of sci- the scientific, social science of, of wisdom, and a lot of, a lot of interesting research on this. So, so then he did his dissertation on, on wisdom. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, but then, uh, a few years later, he, was, he had graduated. He was doing a clinical practice. He was back in town. We got together for lunch. And he said, I don't think I'm quite done with this idea of wisdom. And so we started talking. Uh, the conversation ended up becoming this book, A Time for Wisdom. And Paul, in the meantime, had developed this sort of four-step model for what wisdom looks like. And, and I really liked it. So I, I came along as someone who had, had written before and sort of helped him find... Uh, life for this book, and, and we really enjoyed working together. Um, but the ink is permanent, so we made some mistakes, and I, uh, as, as often happens when we write. So, so if we think of a continuum, and, and as Janine mentioned, I liked integration, so I don't really like the continuum too much, but if we think of a continuum between social science and the sacred, when we approach the topic of wisdom, I think the first thing to acknowledge is it comes from our religious and spiritual traditions. It comes from our faith. The whole notion, you hear the term wisdom traditions, what that means is religion. If you, if you kind of figure out what wisdom traditions are, they are the different world religions. So in Christianity, we have a wisdom tradition. Now, Paul and I, remember my conversation when he came in my office, we were approaching this from science because it was, a, it was a dissertation for a doctoral degree. So we were looking at it from social scientists. And so we started with the science of wisdom. And as Janine mentioned, I like integration. So in, in his dissertation and in the book, we tried to nudge things a little bit so it moved over more toward the sacred. But here's where I think we made a mistake. We didn't nudge it far enough. So right after the book came out, I was talking to a group of Presbyterians in Newburgh, actually, and it was a talk very similar to this, and someone in the back raised their hand and said, um, and I made the point that the book we wrote was actually not a Christian book. It was a book meant for a general audience, and someone raised their, raised their hand and said, how, how could that be? How could you as a Christian write a book about wisdom that isn't a Christian book? And I pondered that for a week, uh, and then right in that same week, we had, we had a number of reviews come out at the book, about the book, as happens when you write. And, you know, reviews have a standard format. They always say nice things, and then the last paragraph is always what they wish you would have done different. And one of the reviews that came out in the interviewing, intervening week was the same thing. Here's uh, Paul's a Roman Catholic. I'm Protestant. Here's two Christian men writing this book on wisdom, but they didn't talk enough about their faith tradition. How do you think about wisdom without talking about your faith? And and we did talk some about our faith, but not enough. So the ink's permanent. I can't go back. What you'll hear today is not going to be a lot of scripture, a lot of Christian theology. It's going to be more science. But next week, I hope hope if you come back, we'll do a little bit more of the integration. But the science of wisdom is also quite interesting. So hopefully you'll stick with me through this. I'm reminded all through Christian scripture, here's one verse, Proverbs 9, but we we see this notion all through scripture, right? That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I think the critique is valid. If you you skip over this, if you don't start with the assumption that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, where do you end up? And I think that's a, a valid critique in this work that Paul and I did. All right, so let's think about sort of what I want to cover today and then what I hope we can cover next Sunday. Um, First, why? Why is this a time for wisdom? And second, what is wisdom anyway? We're going to kind of get into the weeds and look at definitions of wisdom and it's um, it's tricky. It's tricky business to define what wisdom is and and you'll see that. And then next week we're going to look at this four-step model that Paul developed and I really like it. Uh, It's four steps toward developing wisdom, knowledge, detachment, trying tranquility and transcendence. And there's certainly lots of room for our faith, for, for Christian belief, and as, as well as for spiritual practice in, in all of this. And uh, after, today, I'm going to sort of pause a couple times. We'll talk about why is this a time for wisdom, 
And then in a few minutes, we'll just sort of pause and see if anyone has comments or, or questions. And then we'll go on and we'll move to the second part, what is wisdom anyway? We'll get into the definitions. And then at the end, we'll have, I hope, some more time for comments and, and questions. Why is this a time for wisdom? Uh, it turns out that the Gallup organization does a poll every year, uh, and it's called the, the Negative Experiences Index. They also have a Positive Experiences Index, by the way, which is just for fairness, they do both. But by looking at negative experiences, what they do, and this is worldwide data, they're collecting data on people all over the world, and, they, and they're looking at things like pain, worry, sadness, stress, and anger. And then they take the responses that people have and they create a composite score and put it on a scale of zero to 100. And they, uh, and they report then once a year sort of how negatively people are experiencing life. Um, by the way, I, I don't have a graph for this, but I'll just say this. The positive scores are much higher than the negative and they've tended to be stable. So even though the negative experiences have gone up, as you see in this graph, the positive experiences have not gone down which is sort of interesting. Um, but people are more unhappy, even if they're equally happy, they're more unhappy than they used to be. Now we would expect a COVID bump here, right? We would expect that in 2020, this would go up. But it was going up long before COVID. It's interesting to notice, really, the turn of the century, and we, we don't have data far back, that far back, but the turn of the century introduced a lot of challenging things. Just think of the things that we've encountered in this century. Um, and the one, and we could mention any of these, I'm not going to, but, but the one I'm going to mention is increasing polarization. How, how much we tend to look at the other as the other now, and how we have polarized ourselves. Uh, some interesting data from the Pew Research Center that came out less than a year ago, asking both Republicans and Democrats what they think about members of the other party. And it's really fascinating to see what we, we see. If you ask Democrats or Republicans, are, uh, are, are the, uh, is the other party more closed-minded than, than your party? So, like, if you're a Democrat, are Republicans more closed-minded than, than Democrats? Or if you're, you know, inverse, if you're the other party. And the thing that's really striking here is look at the difference between 2016 and 2022 in terms of how the graph is going up in each of these. And there's more, there's, um, there's three more. Are they unintelligent? Are they lazy? And then you ask people, are, have, the, have you answered yes to more, four or more of these? And you see, the, the, again, the the, the slope goes upward. We are more polarized now than we've ever, well, I don't know, I don't know if, than we've ever been. We're more polarized than in recent history, let me say that. There's lots of animosity. Um, so, why is this a time for wisdom? Because we don't naturally want to listen to each other. We much prefer to yell at each other than to listen to one another. This is a time for wisdom. There was a day, some of you remember Walter Cronkite. He was on when I was, he was a news broadcaster when I was a kid, and he would wrap up his, um, his news show, and that's the way it is. There was a thing back in the day of Walter Cronkite called the Fairness Doctrine, which is really interesting. It's, it, and it was, it was required, mandated by the Federal Communications Commission, that if you, if you gave a particular position on a certain issue, on public airways, you had to give the alternative, an equal time and a fair presentation of the alternative also. It was called the fairness doctrine. You had to have balance in how you presented the news. The Reagan administration um, saw this as increasingly problematic and so they, they nullified the fairness doctrine. And, it, and in a sense, it was increasingly problematic because of all of the different cable news networks that were popping up, and they just couldn't possibly monitor all the different news networks. Back in the day of Walter Cronkite, there really were only three or four major networks, and so they could monitor those pretty closely. So now we have news outlets all over the board, right? And there are even organizations that that sort of rate how conservative the various news outlets are. So you've probably seen this, where there's uh, you, some news outlets tend to be more conservative, some tend to be more progressive. 
And we all struggle to know, are we hearing both sides of the issue? Are we, are we able to think critically about this? Because, you know, if you watch Fox News and CNN, you're going to get a very different story about, about what's going on. This is a time for wisdom, and it's a time when it's hard to find wisdom. We have sort of designer news, news for what we want to hear. Or think about social media. What has social media done? In a sense, it's created these echo chambers where we hear what we want to hear. Think about how this works. You choose who your friends are on Facebook, right? And then you post something, and they all like it, and they think, wow, what a great thing to post. And then you get the sense that everybody thinks like us. Everyone thinks this way. But it's because you chose your friends in the first place, that they all like what you have to say. So that's an echo chamber. It's like um, this sense that we get feedback according to what we want to think rather than what other people think. So it makes wisdom challenging and difficult. Why is this a time for wisdom? Because we are exhausted, we have negative experiences, we're stressed, we're looking for a way forward. It's a complicated time. Now, there are two things I was going to do today. One is talk about why this is a time for wisdom. The second is look at all these definitions. The second part is going to take longer than the first. So I'm going to pause right now um, and just see, and Janine has offered to walk a microphone around, to see if there uh, are questions or comments. I realize we're just 15 minutes in, but, but let's take a few minutes if there are comments you have or thoughts or questions. You just raise your hand and we'll find you. Right there. Is lying an impediment to wisdom? Certainly, certainly. Uh, but I think you're asking more than that, aren't you? I mean, absolutely, yes. But the challenge is. We live in a time where if we disagree with someone, we sort of assume they're lying. So, so you, I, hear that, I see this a lot on social media. So-and-so is lying. But what it, and it might mean, be that they are, but it might also mean I disagree with so-and-so. And so I'm going to call you a liar if I disagree with you. So, so yes, lying is an imped impediment to wisdom, but so is calling people a liar sometimes. It's, a, it's complicated, yeah. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I don't know that the mic was on, but let me repeat that, which is amazing because I have hearing impairment, but I could actually hear you. Um, so Solomon, uh, you know, you know in, in our Christian tradition, known as the one who is sort of wisest of all, and it comes from God. And so, and, and there's a passage, I think it's in James, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, yeah, James 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God and God will give it to you freely. So, so the source of wisdom is God, which again, the ink is permanent. We didn't actually say this in the book, but I, I completely agree with you. I also find that uh, the paradox in that, you know, there's, there's question about, uh, the wisdom tradition in terms of authorship and all that, but I also find it curious that we take Solomon to have written that passage about Solomon being the wisest person of ever, and, and, and then it sort of makes me, makes me shiver a little bit. Um, any, anything else, other questions or comments? One in the back there, yeah. Yeah. So, so I started to say that uh, when I was showing you the graphs on the Pew Research Center data. Um, maybe, they, they certainly, I think they're more divided than I've ever seen in my lifetime. But then I wonder, there, you know, we always have this tendency to look at history in our experience rather than looking back. So I wonder in ages back, there probably have been times that have been equally divided, maybe even more divided. Um, but I don't, I don't know, I'm not a historian, but it'd be fascinating to ask a historian that question. Things probably, you know, there is a 
remember in the middle of COVID, we were all thinking like it's never been this bad. And there was a, a Radio Lab podcast that actually went back and found out there was this year 536 that was way worse than what we were experiencing COVID. In 536, there was some kind of volcanic activity that cast a, a cloud of dust over Europe for two years so that they didn't have summer. It was like dark almost all the time. The plant life, if you look at fossil records and so forth, it looks like every, lots of things died, nothing thrived in those times. So our tendency is, and we call this presentism, our tendency is to look at the present day and assume we know about how bad things have been in the past and we, we clearly don't, so yeah. But things are very, very deeply divided now, whether it's been worse or not, I don't know. But. Yeah, uh, one more question and then I think I'll. Test. So we're an aging population in the world. And if with age comes wisdom, how do you explain what's I'm, happening? I'm sorry, I missed the question. We're an aging population aging in the population, world. Aging population, yeah. And with age supposedly comes wisdom. So how do you explain yeah. that? So I'm going to question that. Uh, so the assumption is the older we get, the wiser we get. The science doesn't actually bear that out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in just a few minutes, actually, I'm going to show you a graph that's very humbling for those of us who are aging, because um, <laughs> it doesn't actually show that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One more? One more, yeah. yeah. So I, I geek out on history, and it gives me hope with the pendulums and... Yes how yeah. God may be allowing things for some cleansing and renewal. Yeah. So one of the things that is very interesting is talking about the changes in communication styles and then when life went insane again. You know, um, just like when the Bible was written into German, you know, Martin Luther, then you had the presses and free-flowing information, whether it was fact or fiction was allowed and there was a lot of yellow journalism, lots of things. So I'd love to hear more about what you think about journalism today. And since social media, Twitter, everything else just allows everybody to be a journalist, <laughs> how that has been um, I impactful. Oh, that's a, that is such an interesting question. And, and I, I mean, we could talk for hours on that one. Um, thank you. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn gave this uh, uh, address at Harvard, a commencement address at Harvard, I think it was 1980. He talked about superficiality and how much it was part of Western culture. And he really attributed it to the media, um, which, you know, here, here's someone coming from Russia, a Christian, um, critiquing American society and thinking that media just made us so superficial because you can say anything you want, basically, whether you have really good support for it or not. It comes, it comes back to the lying question in one sense. Now, I'm being hard on the media, too. I think we have to have a free press. What would the alternative be if we didn't, right? Um, but it can lead to, and social media, boy, it really does amplify that. I think also, I think of the sort of the Christian notion of profit and what it means to be a prophet. I think the social media has made all of us think we're prophets too. Like we can call out anything or anyone and that, that we have a sort of a right or even an obligation to do that as Christians. But we get into all kinds of mischief uh, with this. Social media, you know, and, and the other thing I really like about your question it, it, History is not like a steady progression. There are, there are events in history that change things radically. So the printing press you mentioned, absolutely. Combustion engine, internet. There are things that change. And, and so we sometimes think that change is accelerating. I don't know. We might just be in a time where the internet's been developed and we're adjusting to the change just like the combustion engine you know, 120 years ago caused us radical times of change. So I don't know. That's yeah. AI now, yeah, AI, and who knows where that's going to go, right. So what is wisdom? Here we're going to get into the weeds, talk about definitions. Um, this, it's easy to identify what isn't wisdom. <laughs> okay, so YouTube's filled with examples of what's not wisdom, but what is it? So I want to give you kind of three different attempts to look at wisdom. 
And again, I'm coming at this as a social scientist. And the social science, Paul went to the library, he proved me wrong. The social science started in Europe. It started largely in Berlin. There was a, a the Max Planck Institute at University of Berlin where they studied, they had lots and lots of studies on, on wisdom about 30 years ago. So here was the way that they defined wisdom in the, in the uh, Berlin wisdom uh, work. Wisdom is expert knowledge in the fundamental pragmatics of life. Now I'm going to talk you through five parts of this to sort of explain what, what the researchers meant by expert knowledge in the fundamental pragmatics of life. And here are the five. And I'm going to tell you a little story as we go through to sort of illustrate. And this story actually, it, it, it's, I was raised in a family where we didn't have um, pets inside the house. We, I lived on a farm and we had we occasionally would have pets, but they'd be outside. And so when I got married to my wife, who always had pets on the inside of the house, we had a little bit of, uh, and we've been married 45 years now, so we clearly we've worked this out, but we had a little working out to do with what does it mean to have a pet that comes inside the house. And so I had, I had some learning to do. Um, so we had a cat. It was actually our, I don't know how a cat belongs to anyone, but the way we thought of it in our family is that my daughter had this cat. So my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter's cat, Frisky. And we were dog-sitting for Lisa's family member, and the dog came and stayed at our house, but the cat ran off when the dog came. And then the dog went home, and the cat didn't come back. Uh, and so Frisky was gone, and I was... Uh, I was, come, I was at home one night, Lisa was coming home. Lisa was getting her, her doctoral, doing her doctoral work. She came home from graduate school that day and drove up over the mountain where we lived and saw Frisky dead on the side of the road and came home and told me, Mark, I saw Frisky dead on the side of the road. And I immediately felt bad, just instinctively terrible, knowing that my daughter was going to be in a lot of grief and pain. She had just gone to bed. Um, but what I didn't know is that, that there was some obligation for me to go get the cat and um, bring it home and bury it. And so, I, so we, Lisa and I figured that out. So I went up the road and took a cardboard box and I you know, scraped the cat up and it was really, really disgusting. I had maggots all over its face and uh, came home and uh, in the midst of an Oregon rainy fall day, I dug a hole right beneath an oak tree and buried the cat. And, um, so, so part of wisdom is just knowing the facts. I, and we didn't even know that where Frisky was, but once Lisa came home and said, Frisky's dead, then, then we knew. And then the procedural knowledge is, what do you do then? And that's what I had to learn from Lisa is, oh, okay, at that point you have to go, you, go, you bring the cat home and, and you bury the cat. So what do you do then after you bury the cat? Well, Clearly, we had to go to tell Sarah, and Sarah had a hard time going to sleep at night anyway, so, so we knew she would still be awake. And so then you have to think about what, what life is going to look like for your eight-year-old daughter, and how do you break the news that your cat just died? And uh, we realized, even at that young age, that she was going to grow and live a life where she experienced pain. And, and while it might be tempting for us to sort of shield her from that pain, we needed to let her know. And we didn't know that 25 years later, no, more than that. I'm doing the, doing the math in my head. 20, uh, close to 30 years later, that she was going to have a husband who came home after 10 years of marriage and said, I'm done, I'm leaving. We didn't know that she was going to have that kind of pain in her life. But we knew that she was going to have pain. So, so we went downstairs to her bedroom, and we flanked her bed on either side, Lisa on one side, me on the other, and we told her that Frisky was dead and that we had buried... Fris, Frisky was dead and we had buried him. And we recognized that was part of a, of a long life, that she was going to have to encounter that sort of pain. And then there's this values relativism that comes into the wisdom definition. And that's not a sloppy pluralism as much as it is saying that values compete. Values constantly compete. So if you, uh, if you have an alarm that goes off at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, um, oh, alarms, yeah, yeah. If you have an alarm that goes off at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning 
and you're tired, there, and you have a job to go do, and it starts at seven, you have competing values, right? One, and they're both good. One is, my body needs rest, I'd like to stay in bed longer. The other is, I need to be a loyal employee, I need to show up in time for my job. That's what we mean by values relativism. They're always gonna be competing values. So you recognize this, if you're a parent, you recognize how this works. Your daughter's cat has just died, she's eight years old, you would love to, that you have a value of protecting her from harm. That's a good value. And you have a value of being honest with her and telling her the truth. That's a good value too. And so they're gonna be competing with each other. And that's often what happens with values. And with wisdom, we have to recognize the competing nature of values in our life. Lisa and I decided, rightly I think, that it was better to tell the truth, and, and so we told her. And then managing uncertainty. What do you do when your eight-year-old daughter says, do cats go to heaven? I asked Siri this morning, I was, I was, thinking, I was preparing, I asked Siri, I said, do cats go to heaven? And Siri said, no, cats don't go to heaven. She referenced a Wikipedia article. So then I asked, do dogs go to heaven? And she said, all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'm a little confused about that. But, but Sarah had to sort of manage her own uncertainty as we were sort of dealing with the grief of this. Now, so those are the five steps of wisdom in terms of the early research on this. Unless it sound like I'm an incredibly wise parent, um, I'll tell you the end of the story. So we were sitting in the living room playing cards a couple weeks later, and one of our other daughters sort of bounced in the room and said, Dad, Mom, Frisky's back. And I said, no, Frisky died. I buried, I buried him two weeks ago. No, really, Frisky's back. Come look. So we went out to the porch, and sure enough, there was Frisky. A little skinnier than usual, but definitely Frisky. So, um, so I buried the wrong cat. Okay. So based on these five criteria... Wisdom being expert knowledge in the fundamental pragmatics of life, the five criteria. The researchers, um, not just in Europe, but actually throughout the world, developed a way to assess wisdom. It was kind of complex. They had people look at newspaper articles and write responses, and then they would assess how wise the responses were. So this is what we assume, right? That as you get older, you get wiser. It's been part of our, you know, our lore for centuries, I, th I suspect, that we think that there's not many good things about aging, but at least one of them is we get wise. Well, not so much. If you actually look at the research on this, wisdom plateaus in uh, the age, ages between 13 and 25, there's a huge growth in wisdom. And then after about age 30, uh, I, my, my graph's a little off, it tends to plateau and stay pretty steady over the lifespan, in, in terms of this early definition of wisdom at least. Now, in fairness, I also want to mention there's a cross-cultural dimension to this. So using the same definition of wisdom, some other researchers looked at wisdom in, the, in Japan and the United States. And what they found is in the United States, wisdom does seem to keep increasing over the lifespan. In Japan, it doesn't. It seems to be pretty flat from age 30 to 70. But lest we feel too uh, smug about this, notice that the average 30-year-old in Japan is already as wise as the average 65-year-old in the United States. <laughs> so what does that mean? Um, and I don't know. I mean, there's interesting... Yeah, in Japan, you know, it's a culture where people have a lot of respect for older folks, so maybe they learn more quickly from those who are older uh, around wisdom. I, I don't know, it, it, but it's interesting. The relationship between age and wisdom is messy. All right, so that was the first one. I want to mention sort of the second uh, definition of wisdom then, which is a group of um, international scholars, people who have studied wisdom, uh, got together in 20... 18 or 19, right before COVID, and they, the definition they came up with was published in 2020. So this is kind of a newer definition now for wisdom. And here's what they came up with. Oh, um, I should say that early, the first definition, the, the Berlin one, it's been criticized pretty resoundingly because it's so cognitive. It, it's sort of making wisdom seem the same as knowledge, and wisdom must 
involve knowledge, but it's got to be bigger than knowledge too, right? And so, so this is an effort to make wisdom a little bit bigger than knowledge. So the definition that these scholars came up with is wisdom is morally grounded excellence in social cognitive processing, kind of a mouthful. Um, there are a couple things I like about it, uh, a couple of concerns I have too. One is I, I, I like having morality here. And, and it, in some ways, it gets us back. Remember I said that the science of wisdom has tended to ignore the sacred traditions, wisdom traditions, religion, spirituality. We've tended to just look uh, apart from that. But, but faith brings us back to issues of morality. And so I like that this is morally grounded excellence, that there's at least, at least a nod toward the fact that moral values matter. The other thing I like about this one is it includes social cognitive processing. It's not just how we think about a thing. It's, it's, it's relational. It involves how we connect with one another. So it seems like it's making a step forward. Um, let me give you an, uh, an example of this. Let's, this happened to me recently, actually, so it's probably fresh in my mind. But let's say somebody posts something on Facebook that's really nasty about you. So they sort of name you and call you out on Facebook in a way that feels really unfair. What do you do? How do you respond? Do you respond? Do you say anything? Um, so wisdom in this case, and here's where I like the, the, word, the word moral needs to show up there, right? Because there is a moral dimension to how we choose to respond or if we choose to respond. If you just sort of start slamming back because someone slammed you, it's probably not going to lead you down a path that's helpful for anyone. Um, and I like the idea of social. You, there's an audience here. Facebook is, is, has an audience, so there's a social dimension. If we start fighting our fights in a public arena, um, what does that do for the, for the observers of faith, the observers of relationship? What does that do for us as human beings? Um, so, so I like this definition. It's, it's, it's better than the other one. Um, there are still some concerns. I still don't think it leaves enough room for faith, and that's something, again, we'll talk more about next week. Um, and the other part is it sort of leaves out the whole area of emotions. So, so let me show you uh, the, the words of Judith Gluck, who is one of the researchers who got together and helped, to, uh, she was an, she's an Austrian wisdom researcher, but she, she was part of this definition, but she didn't like it. So you, get, you think about how these definitions happen. You get a bunch of people in the room, researchers, and they come up with a definition and then they vote on it. She didn't really love the one they came up with. And it's because it didn't have enough about human emotion in it. So I'm just going to read this. This is really fascinating what she wrote in an article about after this definition came out. She said, having studied wis wisdom for over 20 years now, I think I've learned quite a bit from my own research. If someone describes a difficult life problem to me, I can produce a response that would probably be scored as wise. I consider myself rather morally grounded, and I have become quite skilled at considering different perspectives, balancing interests, appreciating broader context, and knowing the limits of my knowledge. Now, watch what comes next. Yet there are moments in my life, family conflicts, endless and useless meetings, interactions with difficult students, where I yell, slam doors, and curse, or at least would like to, and where I am neither wise nor act wisely. How is that possible? Does this sound familiar? Uh, I mean, wisdom sort of has to show up in our emotions too, right? And, and it often doesn't. I, um, I had a situation this week where I was driving along and uh, someone pulled over changing lanes and it, I, I must have been in his blind spot because he didn't see me. So I had to kind of move off the road to avoid an accident. And I honked and I felt instantly angry. And... I had to figure out how to manage that emotion. If, if, if so, because then, you know, then you, the, the way it works out is you're sitting next to each other at a stoplight a few minutes later, right? <laughs> so how do you manage that emotion when you're in that situation? And fortunately, I had a few moments to sort of calm down and remember that I do that sort of thing too. And, uh, but, but, but we have to learn how to manage these emotional things as part of wisdom. All right. So now I'm going to give you the one that Paul and I came up with, our, what I call the McLaughlin and McMinn verbose definition of 
wisdom because it, it's long and there's lots of words here, but it tries to incorporate some of the concerns that we have um, with this wisdom. Uh, so here we go. Wisdom is, first of all, embodied. I'll read the whole thing, then we're going to go back and look at parts of it. It's embodied disposition or act involving critical contemplation, purgation and purification of knowledge. I know, long words. Remember, Paul was a philosopher. Um, purification of knowledge with practical implications leading to self-transcendence, trans tranquility, and elevated insight. So, first of all, wisdom is embodied. I remember as a child making taffy with my mom and my sister. My sister's one, years old, one year older than me. And we were sitting around watching mom sort of boil this taffy. Uh, it's a liquid before it, sol it gets solid. And mom was saying, it's really hot. Don't touch it. And so mom turned her back and went to another part of the kitchen. And my sister, wanting to figure this out, put her thumb in the taffy. Um, and I remember instantly it just it, the blister just formed instantly, and she screamed, and she was in great pain. And both my sister and I learned an important lesson about wisdom that day, which is uh, hot things really are hot. There's a physical consequence to that. Wisdom is often embodied, right? It, it shows up in our body. It's the way we learn things. Um, again, it's all over YouTube. <laughs> Probably, probably won't happen again. Um, embodied wisdom, right? Um, I have, it also means that so much of wisdom comes from observational learning. I have two granddaughters who are 13 now, and I, I kind of was doing the math the other day, realizing two years from now, they're going to be driving. Um, and they're going to have people pull over in front of them, and they'll, on the, you know, they're going to have to figure out what to do. And, 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 and yet, so much of what we learn about driving is by observing other people. They'll know, by the time they're 15, sitting in the front of the wheel of a, or behind the wheel of a car, they're gonna know a lot just by watching other people drive. So my 13-year-old granddaughter will ask me questions when I'm driving. She'll ask me about traffic laws and things about the car, and she's learning. In her body, she's learning about how to drive. So wisdom is embodied. And, and here is, I, I mentioned at the beginning, we've missed so many chances to think Christianly in this book because we were trying to write a book for, for a general audience, but there's so much in Christian tradition. If, if Janine were standing up here and talking about Gnosticism, she could tell you so much in the uh, Christian tradition about how important it is that we think in embodied terms about our faith. It's not just the ideas, that, that, that the knowledge we have in our heads that matters. It's, you know, Jesus becomes human. John 1, 14, that, that verse that's really at the very center of Scripture, right? The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, full of grace and truth. Here it is, God embodied in humanity to be with us. Um, verse chokes me up. Okay, wisdom is also a disposition or an Act. Now, this sounds like jargon. Let me tell you uh, why this is important. Let's think about anxiety for a minute. Researchers uh, for anxiety talk about whether it's a state or a trait. So a state of anxiety would be like, let's say you're worried about um, something that your, your child is facing, um, and, and you're, you're, you're stressed about it, you're feeling tense about it. That's the state of anxiety. The trait is like you're almost always worried about something. So, so my wife and I, uh, in our 45-year marriage, she's, she can be anxious, but she's not generally anxious. But she'll look at me and say, Mark, you make stuff up to be anxious about. You're always anxious. If you're not anxious about something, you make something up to be anxious about. <laughs> so, so I have the trait of anxiety. Um, she has a state. We both have the state of anxiety at times. So, so now let's transfer this over to wisdom. Is wisdom a state or a trait. Well, what we're saying in the definition is it can be both. So you can choose to act really wisely in a situation, but not necessarily be high on wisdom as a, as a trait. And then some people truly are wiser than others. If I had you think of the wisest person you know, you'd probably think of someone. And that's someone who consistently, not always, but consistently acts in a wise way. So it's both disposition and it's an act. Foolish people can make wise choices. Wise people can make foolish choices. Uh, but wisdom is both, it can be either disposition or act. 
It involves critical contemplation. For his dissertation, um, Paul did this really interesting thing. We developed, with a local church, we developed a uh, wisdom mentoring program. So we had young adults. Remember that graph where wisdom grows most between ages 13 and 25? So we had college students, 18 to 22-year-olds, get involved in a wisdom mentoring group in a local church. And the mentors were older, people that had been identified as wise by their, by their pastors. And they helped mentor the students uh, through some very difficult, challenging conversations. And what we would do in every one of these scenarios is we would give the students a, 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 a sort of sen- a scenario at the beginning to ponder. So here's an example. A friend of yours, now remember, this is an 18 to 22-year-old. A friend of yours comes to you and says that she has just recently been diagnosed with cancer, and it's serious. And she's starting to question her faith uh, because she doesn't know how God would allow something like this to happen. And you yourself are questioning your faith because you're so upset about this. Now, that's the scenario we start with. And we don't answer it. You know, people, people would come into this group thinking, okay, we're going to tell you how to think about this, but we don't. It's critical contemplation. We have you sit with that really hard question, and we, we go to Scripture. We look at, you know that verse, uh, the, the first verse we all memorize when we're kids? Uh, Jesus wept, John, John 11, I think. Um, you remember the context? Remember why Jesus wept? Because Lazarus had died. So we have people sit with that. What do you do with that? The pain of the world, the struggle, the angst that we all feel. And we never answered it. We had students sit in silence. We had people talk about it. And then they went home. And we never gave them a tidy answer for how God causes all things to work together for good. We didn't do it. We had them sit with the struggle. Um, Wisdom involves critical contemplation, holding these hard things. Um, A couple silly examples. Should you buy an electric car? Um, I drove my Tesla Model 3 here. But the more I read about cobalt and lithium and mining throughout the world, it makes me realize this is complicated. And then I'll go home and I plug it into our home energy that's powered by our solar panels. And I think, oh, good, I'm saving the world. But then I think, wait a minute, can we really consume ourselves out of a consumption problem? Have, have, we just, have I just created another sort of problem here? Um, critical contemplation means sitting with these hard things without trying to rush to tidy answers. These are complicated things. I don't know if any of you are On Being fans. It's a podcast that Krista Tippett does. Um, but she had this amazing conversation with... Francis Kipling and David Gushy, one of them pro-life, one of them pro-choice. And what she had them do is talk about the strength of the other person's argument and the weakness of their own argument. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful episode. Where, and, and she found two people that could do that. Most people can't do that. Most people want to talk about the strength of their own argument and the weakness of the other argument. She just flipped that on her head. What's the weakest part of your argument? What's the strongest point, part of the other one? Uh, critical contemplation. This is Paul's dissertation I mentioned. We had, we, had this two co- we had a comparison group. We had this wisdom cohort that did the wisdom mentoring. They met twice monthly with the... Um, I'm just going to show you some data. It's really fascinating to see what happened. Uh, over the course of the intervention, the wisdom group increased in life satisfaction compared to the comparison group. They showed increases in practical wisdom whereas the comparison group did not. Uh, They showed increases in this thing called post-formal thought, which is being able to hold the complexity of the world, that there aren't just simple answers for things. The wisdom group was able to grow in that capacity. And this one, uh, it's an odd graph, because it looks like the comparison group went down so much, but, but for whatever reason, the wisdom group went up slightly in this ability to hold multiple ways of thinking about a thing. So all of this, critical contemplation, critical contemplation. Okay, purgation and purification. Um, So we need to filter our thoughts. So so wisdom requires us, imagine drinking coffee that didn't have a filter. 
it wouldn't be very good, right? You, you, you turn the coffee maker on, it drips through the filter, and that's what we need to do with our thinking because we don't necessarily think that well. If, you, um, if you're a statistics person like I am, you know that uh, on a normal distribution, 68% of people are average on inequality, 16% are below average, 16% are above average. But if you ask people, how good of a driver are you? 93% will say they're above average. Even though 16% is all that's possible, 93% will say they are above average. Are they, you ask any number of positive qualities, and what you'll see is the average person believes himself or herself to be above average on these qualities. The Educational Testing Service asks a million high school seniors, compared to others, how well do you get along with your peers? 100% said they were average or above, 60% said they were in the top 10% in terms of their ability to get along with others. 25% said they were in the top 1% in terms of their ability to get along with others. Ask college professors, how good are you in the classroom as a teacher? 22% will say they're below average. 10% will say they're average. 63% will say they're above average. And 25% will say they're truly exceptional. This is statistically impossible. Um, <laughs> This is, this is all Western sample. I think it would look different in a non-Western co context. So purgation and purification means we have to learn to question ourselves. We have to learn to question our automatic assumptions. And then finally, it leads to tr self-transcendence, tranquility, and elevated insight. Um, yeah, there's this, you probably have seen this story. It circulates around the internet, this uh, three parachute story. So there's a plane that's going down and the pilot grabs a parachute and jumps out. So there's only four passengers left, but there's three parachutes. Uh, so the first passenger is a very well-known medical doctor and he says, I, I have lives to save. I really need to get to ground safely. So he grabs a parachute and jumps out of, of the plane. The second person is a... Um, a, a scholar, uh, and he actually says to the other two, I'm the smartest person in the world. I need to save myself, and grabs a parachute and jumps out of the plane, which leaves only two passengers and the one parachute there. And so the, the third passenger is an old priest, and he says to the fourth passenger, who's a young child, he says, I've lived a good life. I've lived a long life. You should take the final parachute and jump to safety. And the child um, looks at him and says, no, it's okay. The smartest man in the world just took my backpack and jumped out of the plane. So <laughs> we can both have parachutes. <laughs> um, so wisdom takes us up out of ourselves. It, it, sort of, it sort of moves us to a place of uh, not being so focused on ourself. You know, I'm the smartest man in the world or whatever. Um, and I go back to then to where we started. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. That takes us up and out of ourselves, right? It's not about us so much. Um, and that's why I think we missed the boat a bit on not bringing our Christian faith enough into this book. I was thinking as we ended, just to think about ways sort of spiritual practices that maybe help us move up and out of ourselves to give us a view from from outside of who we are. So a couple things came to my mind. I've been experimenting for the last couple of years with an Ignatian practice called the Daily Examine, which at the end of the day, just sort of quietly sit and ponder the events of the day, sort of consolations and desolations. Where, where did I notice God's presence? Where did I miss God's presence? Where did I let others down? Where, where do I feel like a, a, a sense of gratitude and thankfulness for the day? Uh, it's been really meaningful for me. It, it, and it's, again, it's a way to sort of move out of myself, in a sense. I think scripture does that. People who, um, I, I know people who have meditated and pondered scripture for years, and they find it a way to sort of move out of their sort of immediate experience to get a, a larger view. I think nature and beauty does that. I was on a hike last week with some friends, took this picture. It's God's thumb in Lincoln City. Some of you have been there. I was thinking, how could you possibly get stuck in your own little self when you're sitting and looking at a place like this and seeing the grandeur of, of beauty, of nature, uh, or something about being in those spaces that I think creates wisdom? 
And then the other are question marks. I, so, so that's what we have like seven minutes. I, I was wondering if some of you could share spiritual practices that you find useful in terms of promoting your own sense of getting out of your smaller self into a bigger sense of God's presence in the world or other questions or comments you might have about what we've covered. I use uh, contemplative prayer, silence, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, out of that I've been learning that uh, the real spiritual people are people who can connect everything. They see connections. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm starting to learn, for example, I didn't make my cup of coffee. I just pushed the button, and there are probably a thousand other people help me make my ah, cup of coffee. Ah. I love that, I love that. So contemplative prayer and that sense of just connection of so many things. My wife has, has a centering prayer practice, which she's done for years, and one of the things she'll say to our dog whenever our dog barks is, it belongs. Everything belongs, and it's that sense of connection, like everything is connected, everything belongs, so, yeah. In the other question category, you broke things out uh, in age. What about gender? Oh, interesting. I'm sure someone, uh, gender, I'm sure someone has studied that. I. Um, let me try to remember to look at that this week and, and see if I can come back with an answer. I don't think there were any differences with gender. Um, the way they would do this, by the way, you test wisdom, like, like here's an example. They would give you a scenario, like a 14-year-old girl comes to you and says she wants to move out of her home. What do you say? Now, our instinct is to say, no, that's dumb. Why would you do that? The wise response, is, and it would be equally foolish to say, yes, sure, go for it. Um, the wise response is to hold space for questions, like what, what does this 14-year-old, what might be happening in her home? What's she needing to leave? Or where is she going? Does she have an alternative? Was she going to be on the street? Where is she going to be landing? Um, so to, to look for the complexity there and not just come to a simple yes or no answer to these uh, questions. Along those lines, I, I'm just very cu a curious person, so I always want to ask questions and find out where something's coming from, and also not to judge. Like it's not my place to judge. Um, let's let's learn about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, we started today by talking about polarization. I, I feel like we need more people who are saying it's not my place to judge, because that's our first instinct these days is to judge, to say, oh, you're one of them. Uh, we. We just got our extended family some sweatshirts, and you've probably seen the bumper sticker, be kind. But the thing that, that strikes me is the period. It's be kind and then there's a period. And I just love that little period. Um, because there's lots of reasons not to be kind in the world. But the period means so much to me, be kind, period. And that involves curiosity and listening to people, yeah. I was struck by the idea that we do have things in our life at which time our faith is tested. We think we're lost our faith. But I think the point comes when we regrow our faith, maybe the next two minutes or two days, it's coming back because God's behind that faith. Thank you, and let that, let's let that be our last comment, but, but, but a really important one, because remember I told you that scenario about the college students and our wisdom mentoring and what do you do when your friend has cancer, and it raises all kinds of hard questions. But if you try to answer those questions too early, you end up with a shallow, superficial band-aid on top of faith, and if you let people struggle, they, their faith will grow. Their faith will grow to sort of incorporate the hard things of life and not just the simple solutions to life. And, and so that's, I think that's a really important thing. Um, I will mention that I brought some of these books. I, I told Janine I'm really nervous about the money changer and the temple thing. I'm, in the, I'm also the world's worst marketer. But if you are interested in more, I, there's a box over there and there's some options for how you, can, how you can get one if you're interested. No pressure, really. And I'll see you next week and we'll talk about these four steps to moving toward wisdom. Thank you for your good comments and questions. It's been a delight to be with you. Thank you.